We are going to analyze question four from the July 2007 California Bar Exam. It is a crimes and constitutional law crossover question. The, uh, I urge you to uh, stop the video and read the question, but I will give you a quick summary of the facts, hoping you have read them. In this problem, a person named Dan was standing on the, st uh, the steps of the state capitol and protesting verbally about prayer in the schools. And uh, he had a document with him, and with a cigarette lighter out in the open on the steps of the Capitol, he lit this document, thinking that he was burning a copy of the Constitution. And he was talking about this as he was doing it. In fact, he was burning a copy of the Declaration of Independence, but he didn't know that. Now, as he was burning this document, his, it, his hand got hot and he involuntarily let go of the burning document. A gust of wind picked it up and the burning document landed in a construction area nearby on some flammable material. The flammable material blew up and as a result, a pedestrian was killed. And now, our Dan is being charged with the death of the pedestrian. That's the criminal law part of it. So let's look at that part separately. The call of the question says, may Dan be found guilty of murder or any lesser included offense? So let's take a look at those. Uh, the uh, murder, uh, could Dan, uh, what, can Dan be convicted of murder? So we need to look at the elements of murder and see if they can be satisfied. Then they ask about lesser included offenses. Well, what are the lesser included offenses? Well, they are here. The lesser included offenses are voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter. So we really are being asked, can Dan be convicted of either of those three offenses? Let's start with murder over here. Murder is defined as homicide with malice, without excuse, justification, or mitigation. Now this makes sense because the homicide part is the actus reus, is what you have to do. The malice part is the mens rea of murder and excuse, justification, mitigation are defenses. Excuse is a total defense, justification is a total defense, and mitigation is a partial defense because you would mitigate what would have been common law murder down to voluntary manslaughter if you meet the requirements for mitigation. So these are total defense, total defense, partial defense. So then murder is defined as the actus reus with the mens rea without the defenses. That makes sense. So in our case, the question is, is Dan guilty of murder? Homicide, definition, killing of one person by another. But what we mean technically is that the death of the person that the, whatever, the, whatever the defendant did, the conduct of the defendant must have been the actual and proximate cause of the death of the decedent, whoever died. In our case, lighting that paper was the actual cause of the death of the pedestrian because based on the facts we have, it is true that but for him lighting the piece of paper, uh, the pedestrian would not have died. And so his conduct in lighting that document was the actual cause, but was it the proximate cause of the death of the pedestrian? Well, let's uh, keep in mind what the problem is here, that uh, the, the idea, people often have the idea of proximate cause kind of confused, and let's take a second here to clarify. Um, Proximate causation addresses this problem. The problem is that 
uh, what, whatever I do right now, everything I do affects the universe forever. If I move one molecule right now, the universe is different forever as a result of that. And so since what I do has an effect forever, how far out that chain of effect am I liable for injuries that may happen to people? And the proximate causation rules is just a label for it. What it is is just saying is that as a matter of public policy, we injure liability at some point where we say, uh, we give names to that point where we injure liability. And we say things that happen after that, your conduct was not the legal cause, not the proximate cause. Things that happen up to that point, then they, uh, your conduct was the proximate cause. So uh, uh, the, how far out the chain are people liable? And we have the situation here where Dan lit a, a sheet of paper and these strange things happen and the pedestrian ended up getting killed. And now in, in, in that situation, uh, is, uh, you know, what happened was very bizarre. What happened was so bizarre that as a matter of public policy, you might end that person's liability when the sequence of events gets to be that improbable. That's what we do. So you needed to make an argument to the bar examiners that uh, Dan may not be liable for the death of the pedestrian because it just was so unforeseeable that anyone would get killed by lighting a piece of paper on the steps of the Capitol in the middle of the day. People do that all the time. And so it's just so unforeseeable that Dan perhaps should not be liable for it. So now, with that in mind, let's go back and see, they ask us, can you find Dan guilty of murder or any lesser included offense? Homicide? Did Dan commit homicide? Actual cause? Yes, proximate cause? Give them a full discussion here. Answer is probably not, but it's the discussion is where the points are. Did Dan have malice? Intent to kill Dan? No way. Intent to inflict great bodily harm? No way. Intent to uh, engage in wanton, willful conduct in utter disregard of a high likelihood of great bodily harm or death? No way. Felony murder rule, there's no felony going on here. And so you cannot find malice. So if we're trying to decide, did Dan commit murder, he probably did not commit the homicide because of the proximate cause component, clearly did not have the malice. So, so, so already it's impossible to find the murder. And here, uh, defenses, excuse, well, we don't have that problem. Excuses, the only two excuses insanity and infancy, we don't even have that. Justification, two justifications, the privileges and public authority, and mitigation, the partial defense of mitigation, if you know, like heat of passion will get you down there. And so in our case, Dan we have, probably didn't commit the homicide, doesn't have the malice, and so we don't need any of this. You, you, when a crime is mitigated to voluntary manslaughter, it means you already have found what would normally be common law murder. And you're mitigating that common law murder down to voluntary manslaughter. But if you don't have what, what would have been common law murder, you don't get to these issues. So, Dan is not guilty of murder. They also ask lesser included offenses. The only two are voluntary and involuntary manslaughter. Is Dan guilty of voluntary manslaughter? No. We know why. Because uh, there was no voluntariness to the killing. And furthermore, we're not sure he's responsible for the death at all. And finally, involuntary manslaughter. Two ways to get there. Criminal negligence. We don't have this. Dan was not criminally negligent. Misdemeanor manslaughter rule. But the misdemeanor manslaughter rule requires a malum in se misdemeanor. And not burning the flag is, uh, pardon me, a piece of paper, the, the Constitution, is not a malum in se misdemeanor. It's not inherently bad. Okay, it's just you know, it's a rule that people made. And so we don't have a malum in se misdemeanor. Moreover, in this case, the purpose of this statute or the, or the, 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 uh, that he was violating, the purpose of the state statute saying don't burn the U.S. Constitution was to promote allegiance to the country. It wasn't to promote safety. 
and you have to have some connection between the purpose of the statute and the way the person got killed. And so the answer to the question, can we find Dan guilty of murder or voluntary manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter, no. You might ask, what about things like negligent uh, homicide or something of that sort? Uh, and the answer is, those are not common law crimes. Those are statutory and we didn't have to deal with those. Okay, let's look at the second part of the question. Second part of the question uh, second, is that Dan is saying that Dan is being prosecuted and is charged with attempting, charged with attempting to burn the U.S. Constitution and um, the um, and Dan is defending that charge in two ways. He's saying what I burned was the Declaration of Independence by mistake, but that's what I burned. And secondly, he is saying that uh, prohibiting me from burning the U.S. Constitution, that is a statute, state statute that is probably void because I think it invades my First Amendment rights too much. Okay. Let's take, the, let's take um, these one at a time. First of all, uh, at common law, there, were, there was not an offense of attempting a misdemeanor. Anything that was a misdemeanor at common law, there was no uh, crime of attempted misdemeanor. So if this state followed the common law, then there's no such offense, no such offense. But secondly, they charged him with attempting to burn the U.S. Constitution, and he was attempting to do that, and mistake of fact is not a defense to attempt. We all know that. If you, uh, are, uh, if you are trying to, uh, 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 you're trying to uh, uh, commit a crime, you're trying to kill somebody, and the gun turns out unknown to you, the gun was empty, and you pull the trigger five times and didn't go off. Well, that's not a defense to attempted murder. So a mistake is not a defense to attempted murder. Finally, he claims a First Amendment violation, saying that this state statute cannot be enforced against me because it violates the Constitution. Now, so let's talk about that for a moment. This is the constitutional law part of the question. Um, the way you would answer this question is as follows. You would first of all say that the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution applies to the states through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, you know, that stuff. So now you've got the First Amendment applying to the states. Then you talk about what does the First Amendment say. You'd say the First Amendment provides that uh, the First Amendment uh, provides, prohibits the government from impairing people's freedom of uh, speech, freedom of expression. So the First Amendment, although it says the government should not impair your freedom of expression, we know that that is not an absolute rule. There are circumstances where the government can impair it to some extent. And that's what this problem is about. To what extent can the government impair the person's freedom? I mean, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. We know all that stuff. And so we know, for example, if the government wants to impair your speech uh, by content, then we know the rule is a, a strict scrutiny. The government has to show that impairing your speech by content is necessary to achieve a compelling governmental interest, all that stuff. Okay? So if they want to impair your, your speech based on its content, very high standards that the government has to meet. But if the government wants to impair your symbolic speech, what are the standards for impairing your symbolic speech? And that's the problem we have here. What Dan has done, is obviously symbolic speech. And the government has passed a statute saying you can't do that. Well, is that impairing his right to symbolic speech too much? And so you, here's how you would do it. You would answer the question by showing that the First Amendment applies to the states in the way we just talked about. You would point out that, uh, this, that the states are prohibited from violating the First Amendment, that in this case it is symbolic speech that's being protected, 
uh, and the rules for protection of symbolic speech are that the government must not be attempting to suppress the, the speech, not trying to suppress the speech. Secondly, the government must show a substantial governmental interest that they're trying to advance, and that the government does not impair the First Amendment rights any more than necessary to achieve its goals. And so, and you give them some discussion about that. Was the government trying to, in, in this case, saying, you know, don't burn the Constitution? Are they trying to suppress by content? Of course they are. Don't burn the Constitution. So I think they're suppressing by content. Does the government have a substantial interest in not having you burn the Constitution? I don't think so. And so I, I think the rule fails. And finally, you come to the case law here, you might cite a case or two, something like, you know, you don't need to know the name of the case, but the flag burning case. Just point out that the Supreme Court has already determined that, you know, the states cannot prohibit you from burning a flag as a part of your freedom of expression, symbolic speech. And if the court has already decided that, then by analogy, you can't stop people from burning the Constitution either. Okay, and that's the answer. This was a, a nice, clean question. It's easy because it's a crossover, and crossover questions uh, are almost always easier. Because if you, if you have an hour to mess with somebody's mind about one topic, you can demand a lot. But if you're gonna get something like a half hour per topic, then the question, each half hour question, is going to be a simpler question. You can't get as convoluted. And so these questions, these, these are unconvoluted questions, as you can see. And it's because you only had like a half hour on each one. In terms of points, these would be worth about the same po number of points, the first and the second half of this problem. And that's the end of the analysis of this question.